Well, if you have access to a Bible this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in the book of Acts today, but then also really in the book of the Old Testament prophecy of Joel. But it is in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost that the Apostle Peter quotes from Joel and even insists that what's happening on the day of Pentecost is in fact a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy from hundreds of years earlier. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover, and so it's a, it's a pilgrimage festival that happens in the late spring in Israel, and it celebrated the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Jesus was crucified on Passover, which is in March or April. 50 days later is Pentecost, and Jesus had instructed his disciples to remain in Jerusalem and to wait for him to pour out his Holy Spirit on them. Well, that happened, and it was an amazing experience. Tongues of fire came down on them, and they were enabled to preach the gospel, to speak in languages they had never studied for. And there were people who had come for the Jewish festival of Pentecost, Jewish people, presumably, maybe some God-fearers, who had come from all over the Roman Empire, and they spoke many different native languages. And they were able to hear what the apostles were saying in their own language. It's quite an astounding experience. And some there in the crowd thought that what was happening was that people were drunk. And that's where we pick up the reading. So if you're, if you're in those Bibles to Acts chapter 2, I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. And I'm going to invite those who are able to do this to stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. I'm reading from the New International Version. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to be seated. We're going to spend quite a bit of time today talking about the word spirit, breath, and what it means to breathe. Now for you and I it's simple enough. Uh, we breathe in and out every day if we're not thinking about it, and that's respiration. We bring oxygen into our system. Well, you don't need a science lesson. You know how breathing works. But the scriptures tell us that God is spirit, and he doesn't breathe to respirate the way we do. He doesn't need to do that. When God breathes, it's quite something else. And when God breathes in and out, it is creation itself that respirates. It's God's breath that keeps creation alive. Now, it's, it's easy to forget that because most of what happens in nature looks to be very routine. Right? You get a cut. I've got cuts moving. I think I skinned some knuckles putting in a utility box at my house before I left. And that's going to heal, right? Why is it going to heal? Because your body is endowed with the power of healing? Is this really your body? Do it? The scriptures tell us it's because God is continuing to breathe life into that body. And for that reason, that body can heal because of God's breath. When God breathed at the very beginning... He didn't breathe the way you and I do. We breathe empty air, right? But there's another way of breathing, and I've been doing it a lot, and you'll get used to this. I do it a lot. I'm an expert at this kind of breathing. Talking is breathing. In order for you and I to speak, we have to breathe out, and it's our vocal cords that are animated by that. When God breathes, he doesn't breathe empty things. God speaks. God's breathing is God's speaking. Scientists today have uncovered the mysteries of DNA in a lot of ways, and it's an amazing mechanism for transferring information. But where did the information that DNA is passing on come from? 
It's an amazing mechanism for transferring information, but where did the information originate? This is a mystery to scientists. There is no scientific understanding of the origin of information. Where did all that which would fill a library of encyclopedias that's coded into your DNA, where did it come from? Well, the prophets of Israel tell us where it came from. God spoke into the nothing. He imparted information into the chaos. And life began. We're told what some of those early words were. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God said, let there be a separation of the chaos of the waters. And let's create a habitable space for life to exist. And it was so. And then God said, let us raise up a platform for life. The earth in the midst of that Shemaim, those heavens that I've created. And it was so. And then he said, let there be sun and moon and stars. Let there be fish in the, in the waters and birds in the air and let there be animals on the earth and let there be a being made in my image. God was imparting information. That information is coded into your DNA. It's coded into the laws of nature. And the laws do just fine once they have the information, just like your computer does a wonderful job once it has the software. But where did the software come from? It came from the breathing out of God. Why is it important to begin with that? Because when you read God's word, that breathing out continues. When you and I hear his word, God's breathing continues. That is new information. If you could hear it, if you could respond, then you could live the life that he's called you to live. And then when Jesus came, boy, Jesus took those words that had been breathed into Israel through Moses, and he really emphasized what they were intended to say. Not only should you give people permission to live, that's don't kill, but you should learn not to hate. Not only should you not take vengeance on people, but you should learn to forgive. Not only should you not commit adultery, you should learn not to lust. This is new information. No civilization on earth ever strived for such things. But God is breathing into us what it means to be beings made in his image. And every time he does it, we feel the old decay of what we were. And guilt can come at times. Spirit, wind, breath. It's all ruach. When you breathe out... That's your ruach. When the wind storms blow through, the wind is the ruach. When God pours out his spirit, that is ruach. The ruach of God is our life. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we find these words. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. What was happening at Pentecost was similar to what happened on the very first day of the creation of humanity. Humans are inert material, dust, with the Spirit of God breathed into it. And then together they become, my translation says, a living being. The Hebrew word is nephesh, it's sometimes translated soul. So in the scriptures, humans don't have souls, we are souls. We are inert, inanimate material with the Spirit breathed into us, and that's what makes us who we are. So even the most wicked of people on earth who are doing terribly evil things with the life that's been entrusted to them, they too are animated by the Spirit of God. It's the only way life comes into being. So what happens on Pentecost is not like the Holy Spirit was someplace else, and suddenly he comes to the earth. He's been in us from the beginning. God has breathed life into us. But what we need is a new breath. And that's what he's been doing to you through law and teachings and guidelines, breathing new life. And that happens viscerally on the day of Pentecost. And there was a prophet in the Old Testament that Peter remembered reading about who had prophesied that in the end times, God would do that very thing. He would breathe a new breath into humanity and we would live a new way because of it. And that was the prophecy of Joel. Acts 2.17, if you still have those Bibles open, says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. I've been trying, pour is a fine language if you think about it, but it's not like a liquid. 
It's a breath that God breathes. And notice how they all understood what he was saying in their own languages. I want to talk about God's inhaling, life's gasping, and God's exhaling. So we've already talked about the first time that God breathed out on humanity. And that's when he breathed life into us at the very beginning and humanity became a living being. God has been breathing ever since, but his people are resistant to the words he teaches. Many of us would rather have the life God gives us and then be left alone. But God wants us to know that we are dependent on him. And so what he does, and this is what was happening in Joel that set up the prophecy that Peter quoted. In Joel, the people of Israel were under judgment because they had refused to listen. Because through many generations, they had been told what God expected, but they had continued to live on their own terms and by their own values. And so over time, God finally begins to do something. At the beginning of Joel, God breathes in. He inhales. And when God inhales, life goes with him. And so for the people of Israel, what that looked like was that God's breathing in created a vacuum and a locust plague came pouring into the city, into the country of Israel, the worst they had ever seen. Some people think it might be a metaphor for an army that attacked. We don't know. Either way, it left Israel in ruins. The crops were gone. There was no harvest. There was no food. Life was abysmal. God was reminding them of what the world looked like before he created. God inhales. And he shows us what it looks like to be separated. And for the Israelites, it looked like the world was falling apart. The second point is God is humanity's gasping. When, when life begins to go with God, almost all the time, whether you're reading in the book of Judges or reading in the book of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, all through the Bible, even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when God inhales and life goes with him, humanity begins to realize, oh, so we can't do this by ourselves. I didn't know. I thought we could do it. I thought with our science and our technology and our studies and our drugs, we could do it. And they begin to gasp for the life that God is withdrawing. This is the moment for folks to repent. When God begins to withdraw and we get a sense that the vitality of life is being sapped, God gives us opportunity to return to him and he'll return to us. Just listen to these words from Joel. This is just coming up to the prophecy that Peter quoted on Pentecost. Joel chapter 2 verses 12 through 14. Even now declares the Lord... Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. If humanity gasps, God will breathe again. Don't hold your breath. Not repenting feels like dying over time. But if we ask for his breath, he will give it back. And this is our final point. God promises he will exhale in response to our repentance. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 25 I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You'll have plenty to eat until you're full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And then we hit the verse that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost, and Afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This is God's promise. I will breathe again. You must return to me during the time of God's withdrawal. And I will repay all the years that my judgment has eaten. Do you believe that? I think those who are living in sin don't believe that. I think those of us who are going our own way and resisting the call of the Holy Spirit to live the way God's asking us to live, I think we don't really believe that there's a better life on the other side of repentance than the one we're experiencing right now. 
Sin wants you to return to what you were before God breathed on you. Sin is death. You were nothing before he breathed. Anybody remember the day before you were born? Anybody? Before you were conceived? You were nothing. And that nothing creeps. Satan speaks it. Demons speak it. Your body speaks it. It wants you back to what you were before God breathed on you. And that is what sin is. And it seems sweet, but it has your destruction in mind. God is breathing new life, and that's what happens on Pentecost. The prophecies of Joel are fulfilled, and the teachings of God are breathed again into the dirt. And if we can receive it, we can receive life and life abundantly. But it begins with you and I turning from the sin that we have, in, we have grabbed hold of and turning to what the Lord is asking us to do next. It doesn't take a lot to take those first steps to life. But as you take one step, the next one becomes easier. It's not just sin that becomes easier as we do it. Life becomes easier as we do it too. It's that first step to becoming a living being. This is why you're here, church. Each of you has been created to choose whether you want life. But the life that God breathes is a life spoken through words. And those words have been preserved for you in that book we call the Bible. 